Hello again, everybody. This is Seb from Interface. Thanks for joining me in my last session for this Interface User Conference 2020, where we're going to talk about sensors. Before we start, quick reminder, as for the previous sessions, please do not hesitate to use the question box from the GoToWebinar to ask questions during the session. We'll try to answer them during the chat. And also stay till the end. We will have a live Q&A session where I will again ask you to participate with your smartphone. So why? sensors we you may have attended the how to communicate with the world uh, where we saw how to connect uh, external peripherals here we are really going to focus on how to use them within interface how to use them within composer so we will take two examples the first one i'm going to use a barcode scanner but it could be any kind of peripheral scanner rfid barcode qr code something that gives you a unique id that relates to an object. Could be a product in a product catalog, could be an employee in an, in an employee database. So how to transform one single code into some corresponding data? And we'll, we'll have a look at two methods to do that. The second case is how to use sensors, like distance sensor, analog sensors that provide you a continuous value. And then you may add a threshold to decide if something should happen in the experience. Let's start with our barcode scanner. So first scenario, uh, you have a very simple kiosk, scan your product to get some information about that. So let's jump to the code and I will reuse my fabulous Malbec bottle. If you attended the previous session, you know what I'm talking about with this code, which I will scan here. There we go. And so back on our screen, you can see a code was scanned and we get some information about this bottle of wine. So what is behind the scene? Let's have a look at a first trigger. So again, we are using interface assets. We have one which is handling the communication on the serial port with this ELO barcode scanner and that raises a trigger code scanned. As you can see on the right hand side here, the code scan trigger has one parameter, the code itself, which we are going to reuse in the actions. So in the experience, we have a list of wines, which is this one here. Don't look at this table yet. We will use this in the second method. And so this list has a catalog, a number of bottles. We want to reduce this list to the one that matches the code we just scanned. That's how we are going to use, that's why we are going to use an add filter. And we want to keep only the result which has a barcode value, the column barcode in the Excel file, equals to the code we just scanned using a binding. That's about it. One trigger, and then we reduce the list of n bottle of wines to one single bottle of wine. All right, how do we display this remaining line in interface? What are we actually looking at right now in the center of our scene? So let's have a look at this second snapshot from Composer. And so what is this? What is this information? Where does it come from? If we look in the scene structure, we do have a group with some images, text assets, and what you can see on the right hand side here, you have lots of bindings, these little bullet points, these are reminders showing you all the bindings you have in your scene. If you remember, I said we are reducing the list of wine bottles from N to one, meaning you have only one row remaining in your Excel file at that moment. And that's the trick, if I may say. All the objects you see on the left hand side are going to be bound to the row number one. That's the result of your filter. Because you have something, you have an object which matches your code, this row number one exists, and there's only this one, and it contains the proper values to display on the scene. So all these columns here are going to be assigned to the placeholders you have available in this group in your scene. So if I reset the experience and maybe scan another code, let's go with this one. That should be a Chardonnay. And we do get the Chardonnay. So if you want to display only one product, one information at a time, 
this method works and is ideal because it's simple. You have a list, you filter, you display the result of the filter. Good. What if you want to display the full list of products and select one of them, but keeping visible the whole list? Let's jump to our second methodology. In this case, let's look at the center of the scene right now. Let's imagine you have a, touch, a kiosk with a touch screen. Actually, I could just scroll through the collection and while scrolling through it, I get some information. So I do have a list of wines at the top. When I select one of those, it shows me the detailed information at the bottom. In this scenario, what happens if I scan again the Malbec? Let's go with that. So you have seen two things. You saw two things. The first one is the collection here at the top moved to the proper object. And then, because it moved to the proper object, it displayed the detailed information at the bottom in the main area. So what's the difference and how do we make this happen? Well, the first thing actually is not related to the scanner at all. So let's forget about this one for now. Let's focus on our collection here, this one, which is displaying the list of all the bottles available. We are using on the template, so on this object here, we are using a moved into focus trigger. When the list is scrolled to a, spe a specific item, to a new item, this item gets into focus. Based on that, you can call all the actions we have here, but are going to set the content dynamically into our placeholder. We do have an article in the Help Center that goes into the details about this mechanism. I like to call it the placeholder pattern. It's display uh, some details out of a summary list, something like that. And this works with touch. This works with any way you have to navigate to scroll into this collection, which has a notion of focus. How do we connect the barcode scanner to that? Well, that will be our second trigger. And actually, before showing this, let me just reset. You may see here we do have a list. And here we are going to have a second table. You could call it a lookup table, right? Which is going to associate a barcode. So we have our, our two codes here to some indexes. We have index number two, that's the Chardonnay. Index number three, that's the Malbec. So looking at this trigger. So again, barcode scanner. A code has been scanned. What do we do? This time, we are not applying a filter on the list of wines. We are not changing this collection. Else, at the top of our scene, the asset flow would be filtered, and we would see only one remaining item. And we don't want that this time. That's why we are using an additional table to apply our filter, our lookup table. On this barcode table, which has two columns, the code and the index, we are filtering same ID. We want the only result that has the code equals to the code which has just been scanned. That's the first part. So now we know, OK, this code 0955 something is index number three. What do we do with that? We scroll the collection to the index number three. And because of the previous trigger we looked at, the moved into focus, actually the collection is going to behave as if someone was scrolling to the right index and then do what it's supposed to do. So if I go to any index, uh, scan again, that's the Malbec, 097 something. There we go. It, go, it went to the index number three, and we have one single object remaining in this table, while if we scan the Chardonnay, we get index number two. So two methods for two different scenarios, really depending on what you want to keep visible on the screen. I use Excel. It could be an online database. It's honestly the same ID using a trigger that gives you a code, an ID, and an action at filter set filter by formula if you're using Airtable, 
any kind of filtering system that you send to your database to retrieve the data to display on your screen. All right, I think we covered this one. Again, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. We'll try to answer them in the chat right now. Let's move on to our second scenario. Uh, second example, talking about sensors. The first thing I want to show you is more like a, a tip. It's something which I've been doing for a while using a lot of different and various sensors within the interface. And it's how to use toggle buttons to control the visual states, to control what the user is going to see on the scene. So here we have a distance sensor. And you can see a first screen, which uh, invites you to come closer so that something happens. And then when we, you do come closer, hey, thanks, you're close enough. Please touch to stop, or whatever you have to do. So you're not close enough. Please come. You're close enough. Touch, you're good to go. You can start. So why using a toggle button? Well, the first thing is maybe you don't have always the sensor with you. Maybe you're working from home, you're working in the office, you're working in a plane. And it's an easy way to not have to go to the desk, to have the hardware with you, or to collaborate with your colleague who has the sensor. That's the first thing. The second thing is, in this case, and we're going to look at the triggers here, this button, so that's my toggle button here. We have two triggers, checked and unchecked. And basically, we have here two groups, which are the uh, group far and group close. When you check the button, you show the close, you hide the far. When you uncheck the button, you do the opposite with a little delay in the animations. So only two actions. You could have, I hate this chair. You could have uh, more actions than that. And if you wanted to test them on the buttons, then recopy all the actions on your sensor triggers, you might miss something in the copy. While you could just say, which we are doing here, when you reach the right distance, then just check the button. So it does exactly the same actions. The second advantage is that once the, the button is checked, you cannot check it again. If your light switch is on, you can try turning it on again, but you can't because it's already on. So if your distance value is going to be 3, 2, 3, 2, and both values should be off, you won't try to show and hide and show and hide all your objects again because the button is already in the right state. You cannot force it to be checked again. So that's a real advantage of using the toggle buttons to avoid trying to launch multiple actions. Especially if you have long animations, you might want to start animation, start animation, start animation. And this is going to create some glitches, potentially. So the first example, I'm going actually to switch to the board and uh, do the demo with the sensor. So uh, the sensor is this one. We, I'm using the Nextmosphere demo board. and so. When I put my hand here, I'm a bit far. If I go lower, I'm close enough. If I go high, I'm uh, far away, and I, I go back to the uh, the far screen. So this one is a fairly simple example, first to start with. And so here are the triggers. Uh, Again, that's the simple uh, scenario. And I'm going to show you what could be wrong with this one. So uh, you have the, the two cases on the left and right. On the left, when we receive a trigger from Nextmosphere, we actually, this is uh, the address of this particular sensor on the board. That's number five here. And so the command is going to distance. It's going to be the distance. It goes from one to 10. So in here, we decided to put five as the threshold. If the distance is greater than 5, then we check the button. If it's less than or equal to 5, then we uncheck the button. That's fairly simple. At 5, either you're above or you're below. That sounds simple, but depending on the sensor, depending on the distances you're working with, there might be an issue here. Let me try to illustrate that again with the board. So right now I'm at four, 
five, nothing happens because I said greater than and not greater or equal to. Six, I'm close. But if I go back to five, I'm less than or equal to five. So what if I'm, I'm around here? And what if I have some noise around these values? The screen is going to keep switching between. I mean, I'm out. I mean, I'm out. And especially because here I'm not testing in real conditions. I'm using a, a very short distance with this demo board. But in the real case, you may get some noise from the lights. You may get some noise from the, env the global environment. And you need to care about this noise to make sure you don't have something which is showing hiding, showing hiding, which would be really uncomfortable for the user. So how can you address that? Well, actually, you can do it um, very easily by using what is called an hysteresis principle. The name sounds complex. If you look, if you Google hysteresis, you will see some uh, weird graphs and charts with scientific explanations. But I'm trying to keep this very simple, and you will see how you can handle that. So in the previous example, we went from 0 to 10. We used five as the threshold. And we said, if we are after five, meaning six actually and above, we were in the closed state. What if we were less than or equal to five? So here, we were in the far state. Now, if you have someone who comes from far away and approaches, but your sensor is not, it may have some noise, right? As soon as you get he actually here, you're in the closed state. But if you have some noise like this one, you're going to be far close, far close. And this is going to create the glitch I was talking about. A simple solution is to use this hysteresis mechanism, which basically uses in which state you are to decide what is the right threshold to apply. And instead of using the five, we are going to use, instead of using one single value, we are going to use two values. If you're far away and you're coming closer to your main threshold, the five, which is your theoretical barrier, nothing is going to happen until you reach six. And so from there, as soon as you reach six, you enter the closed state. If you have this kind of noise, you're still in the closed state. To be considered going back to the far, you would need not to reach five, but to reach four. And then only you will get into the far section. By having this kind of neutral zone here, it enables you to not care about the noise which may be created by the sensor. So that sounds complex. Honestly, it's not. Just remember, instead of using five, think of four and six. If we look at the triggers again, these are exactly the same triggers as before, except we are looking at greater than six or less than four. That's it. I said that was super simple. Exactly the same triggers, just don't use one single value. Use one more, one less. We are on, on a scale of 1 to 10, so that's why I have one single digit different. If we're on a percentage, maybe you would use 10 or 15, depending on the kind of sensor you're working with. Now, if we test here, again, going back to the board, so I'm at 4, 5, 6, nothing happens. I kept the greater than not equal to, so I need to go to seven. Where is the sensor? Seven, I'm in. So I'm close enough. You can see the toggle button here is checked, and I see the close enough visual. If I keep moving in this area, it is stable now. I really need to go back to four to get out. And you saw it went from f I went to four, but actually I just went back to five because I don't I can't look at my screen and the sensor at the same time, and I'm still out. It is stable again, so I can I have some free movement here. If I really want to come closer again, I need to move down and then I'm I'm in. So this hysteresis principle is really easy to implement. It can work with such a distance uh, sensor. 
It can work with some phase detection. That's actually what we use in the OpenVINO-based multimode interaction reference design uh, we have on our website. You could use it with deep sight, with any face size um, illustration detection. So just think about when you have this notion of continuous values, use maybe a toggle button to make sure you to define your states without taking care of the sensors first. So actually your graphic designers can work without having the sensors, for example. And then if you have one threshold with a signal which is which may have some noise, think about using this hysteresis principle to avoid using the noisy area to go from one state to the other, but keep some margins basically on both sides. And this concludes our session. Uh, again, stay with us. We are going to switch to the live q and session. So it's time for you to grab your smartphone to tell us what you thought about the session. See you there.